Welcome to IdeaGen TV. Today I am privileged to have with us the global head of International Development Assistance Service Institute at KPMG, Laura Frigenti. Laura, welcome. Thank you so much, George, and uh, I'm so happy to be back uh, with you guys to discuss this very important topics related to, of course, the achievement of the SDGs, but more in general, uh, you know, the role and the importance of multilateralism uh, at the time of the General Assembly. We are here today to discuss a particularly critical SDG, SDG 17, the one that was uh, called at the time of the negotiation around the SDG, the mother of all SDGs, the Partnership uh, for Goals, because it's really the SDG that um, will make it possible for all the others to actually be achieved. And to discuss these important topics uh, with me today is Richard Treffel, who is the global head of the infrastructure practice for KPMG and also the global head of KPMG Impact, which is a relatively new initiative that KPMG launched. And we will have time to touch on that later on during our conversation. Welcome, uh, Richard. Um, let me start with historically. Let's go back to that uh, summer of 2015 in Addis Ababa, the conference that approved the framework of finance for development that obviously was the financial framework that would make it possible for the SDGs to be achieved. And the central pillar of that framework was obviously the strong partnership between public and private sector not only in terms of financing, but also in terms of originating idea, of co-creations of the activities that will have led to the SDGs five years uh, into the making of this uh, agenda. You have been uh, you know, looking at these topics uh, very extensively, in particular for what relates to the infrastructure gap, which was probably in terms of financing the most difficult part uh, to be filled of the SDGs. What has been your experience with that? Uh, thanks, Al, and it's wonderful to be able to join you on the show today for this conversation. So, in 2015 uh, and the development of the of the SDG 17, um, I think has, has 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 taken on a real sort of totemic significance uh, across the world. I remember. Um, in the sort of lead up to the publication, I was asked by uh, a colleague in KPMG if I would comment on uh, the section around transport. Um, and I remember thinking at the time, this is a fantastic initiative, but I'm, I'm worried that like so many others, it won't really take root. Um, and what I have seen over the last five years is the way in which the SDGs have really brought together all organizations, both public and private, in a recognition of their significance. It's given the world a really clear set of balanced goals to go for in terms of, you know, you need to know what your you need to know what your target is in, in any business or organization if you're going to make any sort of progress. Um, sustainable development goals, I believe, have been really, really important, I think for the first time in establishing um, a widely accepted set of global goals. Um, and that, in a sense, is the first starting point to that partnership that you're referring to. Um, we look at the sustainable, at the gap today, the infrastructure gap um, that you referred to, and we can say, well, there's still a huge gap there. Um, but equally, I think we have seen a great deal of progress. We might come on to talk about the way that has been impacted um, I think quite severely and negatively by COVID. But setting that aside for a moment, I think we have really seen a galvanization of effort by organizations to work together in this space. Um, and as you know, I've worked in the infrastructure sector uh, for all of my, my career now. I started life as a civil servant in the, in the UK Department for Transport, working on, on transport policy, and, and then that morphed into a wider infrastructure brief at KPMG. Um, and one of the things that um, I've seen over the, over the course of the last few years um, um, is the way in which um, private investors have increasingly um, demanded to come to the table 
to play an active role in the delivery of the SDG 17. About a year ago, to take a single example, um, uh, KPMG issued a report on the renewables sector. Um, and uh, of course, we have seen tremendous growth in, in renewables over the last few years to the point where I think um, uh, it's estimated that renewables are probably the lowest cost alternative, uh, lowest cost provision for energy in about two thirds of jurisdictions around the world, which is a, which is a huge step change in progress. But well, one of the things that has enabled that has been the unlocking of private capital in partnership with public bodies in order to bring that money to the table. And that report that KPMG issued a year ago described the investor appetite um, for renewables as insatiable. Um, now, fast forward to today and what have we seen through the last six months? And if anything, it's been a strengthening of that investor interest um, to play their part in terms of the development of the world's sustainable infrastructure and indeed across all other sustainable mobility metrics. Um, I was very struck by the uh, World Business Council for Sustainable Development's report a few months back uh, that uh, noted that stocks um, in uh, effectively sustainable assets seem to be outperforming stocks um, in what we might call sort of old world or, or less sustainable assets. Um, and that has just, again, fueled, I think, the desire of uh, global pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, other institutional investors, um, because it's not just about doing the right thing. This is also now about good business sense from their side. Thank you, Richard. That's, uh, that's a very positive assessment, I would say, of what happened uh, in these past five years. Let's talk about the big game changer now, COVID. Of course, you mentioned that, and I think that no conversation on what's happening in global development can be seriously done without taking into account the impact of COVID. Uh, from where you sit, what has COVID been? Has it derailed the private sector from its attention to this goal? Has it actually helped the private sector focus better on the importance of certain global public goods? What is your assessment on that? So, so this is really interesting, Laura. I, I, I remember very vividly uh, back at the end of March this year as the UK was, was going into lockdown a few weeks behind the rest of Europe, um, being really worried um, that um, the, the, the cause of the, of the SDG 17, um, particularly of climate uh, change, would be set back by COVID. Um, it seemed to me inevitable at that time um, that when uh, individuals or businesses uh, feel personally threatened, they will go into survival mode. Um, businesses will batten down the catches, they'll, they'll concentrate on cost minimisation um, and things that are, let's say, nice to have, just things that you know, are going to affect that business for, for the next months or possibly the next couple of years, those will take back seat. That was my expectation. And, and the astonishing thing is, absolutely the opposite happened. And it seems that um, the vulnerability that society is experiencing as a result of COVID has translated into enhanced recognition of the vulnerability that we face the world if we do not get a grip, particularly on climate change, but also the other challenges like inequality in our society, um, all of which are, are flagged up in the in the sustainable development goals. Um, we've seen that, you know, I've seen that and colleagues in KPMG have seen that in conversations with our clients over the course of the last four or five months. Um, it's really noticeable. I'd say up until about a year ago, um, if I'd gone to the, to the chief exec of almost any major global business and said, I'd like to have a conversation about sustainability in the context of your business, um, most of those conversations would have been politely referred to the director of sustainability at the end of the corridor. Um, today, if I go and make that approach, I'm immediately invited into a whole boardroom discussion 
because there's this recognition of the of the magnitude of the of the issue uh, for for the business. And this came through really starkly again um, in KPMG's um, updated uh, CEO outlook that we published about three weeks ago um, in August. Um, so every year KPMG publishes, as, as you know, Laura, uh, a, a outlook survey um, which uh, goes to we go to about four or five hundred or even up to a thousand um, chief execs of some of the world's biggest brands and, and companies, uh, and we ask a whole diverse range of questions about their about their views and where they uh, where they're taking their company. And we did a sort of mini update of that um, in July. Um, in order to publish this this sort of COVID update in August, um, and the, and again the astonishing thing was how strongly the messages around impact and sustainability came through in that. Um, nearly eighty percent of the chief execs who responded said that they had felt it nece necessary to revisit their own sense of purpose over the last few months, and obviously by then extension carry that through in consideration about where their business is going. Um, and another finding I particularly loved out of the survey uh, was 65% uh, of CEOs said they didn't think they would have a job in four years' time if they hadn't really got a grip on the implications of climate change for their business. So again, just to sort of summarise all of that, um, I think the uh, the private sector, whether it's represented within sort of private businesses or, or private capital, um, uh, has a much heightened awareness um, of the importance of climate change and sustainability more broadly than they had six months ago or certainly a year ago. Um, and it's incumbent now to come back to that theme of partnership and SDG 17. It's incumbent on us um, to, to draw on that. Um, in, in really, really powerful public-private partnerships to drive SDGs forward through 2030. I have to say that I also found the CEO surveys this year particularly enlightening uh, in terms of some of the main concern and uh, I would say the focus that the CEO had on this particular agenda. Let me bring you back to, to your personal experience. I mean, you said that you have started your career in the public sector. So obviously you acknowledge the importance of the public sector at minimum as a regulator at maximum in the case of infrastructure as probably a larger significant investors. And now you had a long uh, stretch in the private sector, not only, uh, you know, thinking about uh, issues related to KPMG, but also advising so many companies, particularly on, on PPs. Why is this public-private partnership so important and so critical? And where do you see the complementarities? Uh, sure. So, um, yes, you're, 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 you're kind to refer to my eclectic career path in that way, Laura. Uh, but it has certainly given me uh, the experience of, of, of operating both from a public sector perspective um, and a private sector perspective. Um, and indeed, in my in my last few years um, working for the UK government, um, I was I was in roles which were effectively um, um, on the uh, uh, um, on the on the uh, overlap between public and private sectors working together in partnership. So I was I was involved in the uh, uh, rehabilitation of uh, um, the Channel Tunnel Rail project, which is now known as HS1, uh, which was one of the government's central sort of flagship uh, public-private partnerships in infrastructure. Uh, and then lastly, I was involved as a effectively interface between government and, and network rail, and it was then a private company delivering public services. Um, and 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 I think that um, there's there's something quite powerful I th in the story and um, specifically in the infrastructure space that I've uh, that I've worked in for my entire career um, about the way in which the public and the private sectors can work together. Um, um, at the end of the day infrastructure is um, entirely about the delivery of public services. Um, uh, clearly the, the act of, of creating new infrastructure can, can create jobs and so on um, but but the ultimate goal, of course, is to is to provide whether it's a, a service in terms of 
of clean fresh water uh, whether it's uh, the electricity that keeps the lights on in our houses um, uh, or whether it's roads or um, or railways or whatever um, and and there's if you if you start from that lens and then you say so so what is it about nature of infrastructure that perhaps is is a bit different from what um, uh, a lot of other businesses um, in the world get involved in. Uh, and, it, and it comes down to, for me, um, the scale of investment uh, in infrastructure is, 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 is colossal by the standards of what any business would normally put into anything. So we're, we're often dealing in, in billions of dollars. Um, the time scales are very long, um, uh, multi-generational. We generally invest in infrastructure not for not for your and my benefit, but for the benefits of succeeding generations, which again is quite different from the sort of relatively short-term perspective that many businesses have. Um, there's something really important about the accountability, uh, because again, it is not just to um, the shareholders as it is for most businesses. Although, of course, there is an interesting debate going on at the moment in the world about whether businesses generally should should see just their shareholders as their stakeholders or whether their stakeholders should be wider. But for, for infrastructure, there's never been any question that um, the stakeholders are, are the public at large and certainly the users of, of, of that um, infrastructure, which in many cases would be a whole region or country. Um, and finally, there's something about the sheer complexity um, of um, delivering, maintaining and operating infrastructure assets which require a huge range of skills to be brought to bear. Now, um, the relevance of all that for me is um, that there is something uniquely special uh, about delivering the world's infrastructure, um, which um, requires, on the one hand, what I'd call a sort of public sector mindset, a stewardship mindset, a long-term view, a view that what really matters is the is the the value expressed in what that uh, that country or that city um, obtains from that asset um, and the value to the individuals that use it over time. Um, on the other hand, the, the sheer complexity, the sums of money that need to be spent and so on, play to the opportunity for the private sector to, to, to play a very, very significant role. And if you can bring those two together successfully in a, in a really strong public-private partnership, then it seems to be always self-evident that you've got the best of both worlds. So, so, so from, a, you know, from, from the lens of infrastructure specifically, this has always uh, you know, seemed to be why the partnership model is so much stronger than, than either the public sector or the private sector trying to go it alone. Thank you, Richard. And I think that that takes us nicely to the next topic that I wanted to touch with you, which is KPMG Impact, your uh, most recent baby. And let's uh, uh, give us a sense a little bit about, first of all, what KPMG Impact is, but also, and more important, why did KPMG thought that it was really important to have an initiative like uh, Impact at this point and what parts of the firms does it bring together? Thank you, Lau. So Impact, uh, as you say, was, was launched by KPMG um, only a few months ago. Um, it brings together all of KPMG's capability across ESG and sustainability, economic and social development, uh, sustainable finance, a decarbonisation and climate change, uh, and finally the reporting measurement and assurance of the metrics that, that underpin all of those uh, real world impacts on society um, uh, and i have to say i'm i'm i'm, I'm hugely excited as you know about uh, having been asked to, to lead this for the firm um, uh, not least because it seems to me it dovetails with many of the things that have been passions for mine within the infrastructure space which i I now have the privilege of being able to take more broadly. Um, why have we done it? Um, we have done it, uh, I think, for, for two reasons. Um, um, one is uh, reflected, reflecting a little bit what we were talking about a moment ago uh, around how the 
attitudes of business have changed so radically in the last 12 or 18 months at most. Um, uh, and I think it was incumbent on KPMG to, to respond to that um, and to make sure that it was really able to engage um, in the conversations that um, our clients are seeking from us. Um, uh, and um, on part of it, part of what we've seen is, is not just a heightened awareness of the importance of sustainability that I talked about a moment ago. Um, it's also a desire by businesses to, to think across their impact um, quite holistically. So in the past, for example, um, you know, we might have been asked to respond to a, a tender or get into a conversation about something quite specific let's say and um, companies would come to us uh, and say you know could you could you help us to obtain all of our energy from renewable sources uh, and of course we would very happily support them in doing that um today a lot of the conversations that we are um that we are starting to engage in are much broader they're conversations that that do start from what you know a, a sort of relook at the company's purpose um a recognition that it's not just about that business itself, it's also about its supply chain. So it might bring in, for example, issues of, of human rights within the supply chain or the or the use of plastic within the supply chain. Um, uh, in the case of, of one of our major clients, um, they've 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 engaged us in a in a conversation about the way in which they can support um, subsistence farmers that sit within their supply chain. I mean, not just the farmers themselves, but their communities and the position of women, for example, within those communities. So the, the, the questions that we are being asked to engage in that our, that our clients are grappling with are, are becoming more multidimensional. Um, and, and so that then sort of goes to the second reason for, for creating impact, um, which is a desire rather than to, um, to be providing a series of services that sit in individual silos within KPMG to be able to bring them together and engage in those holistic conversations with our clients. Now, as you know, you know, KPMG has a has a proud history of, of providing you know, services in the sustainability space or the economic and social development and international development space that you lead uh, for us, Laura. Um, but what impact does is it allows us to, to bring all those conversations together. And, and I, I think it's really exciting and it's allowing us to have much richer conversations with our clients. Uh, and uh, and, I, and I think it's very stimulating, to be honest, because I think we have the potential to make uh, a much bigger impact uh, in the world for those, for those clients by thinking about these issues in that much more joined up way. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I actually think that from my observation point in the firm, which is mainly working in emerging markets on these topics of global development, this is an initiative that will really let us uh, be able to respond better in a much more effective way to the multiple challenges that you know all of us are dealing and the clients we want to serve and support are actually dealing with. Let me uh, close with a forward-looking uh, question. We are, we have like 10 years left to, uh, to the 2030 uh, deadline for achieving the SDGs. And I think that the sobering um, you know, conversations that we had around this ANGA is that not one single country uh, at the moment is on track to achieve all the SDG, the complete set. I mean, there are countries that are doing well on certain things, better on others, but uh, not a single country, not even the more mature economy, are on track to achieve the full set of goals by 2030. So um, help us think about what do you see as the role of the private sector as a potential accelerator of achieving this, uh, you know, this set of goals on a broader range of countries? And in particular, I would say thinking about the complexity of the issues in fragile states, low-income countries, uh, middle-income countries, where the bulk of the challenges still sit. Absolutely, um, I'd like to take I'd like to take this off, I guess, into the into a conversation, particularly about the role of technology. 
uh, in helping to deliver those goals within that time frame. Um, uh, because you know, I think there's generally a recognition that a, a lot of technology innovation is expected to uh, come from the private sector. Um, and I think there's something really important about our ability to um, harness technology in order to drive uh, the delivery of the of the SDGs in that time frame. Um, again, if I draw a, a, an example specifically from from my experience in the infrastructure space, um, the the supply chain of of the world's infrastructure is is the construction industry. Um, the construction industry is is in nearly all countries of the world highly fragmented. Um, uh, it is generally um, a low margin industry um, and uh, it is generally an industry that has suffered because uh, those who, who buy from it, uh, whether they are public or private, so whether it's a, a public uh, uh, entity uh, buying uh, rail infrastructure, for example, or whether it's a, a private investor buying a, uh, you know, a new uh, office block or plant, Buyers in the market tend to buy on the basis of what's the cheapest price. Um, and sadly, the effect of all that has been that um, the, the whole sector is, is, is significantly underinvested in us and has been arguably the slowest industry in the world to, to adopt technology and enter its technological revolution. Um, and why does this matter in the context of the SDG 17? Well, it matters massively because uh, there was a study by McKinsey done about five years ago, I think it was now, that reckoned that um, if the construction industry adopted the technologies that are already there today, so technologies around additive manufacturing, for example, off-site manufacturing, um, increased use of robotics, uh, increased use of artificial intelligence, increased use of so-called building information modelling that creates a sort of digital connection between the design of an asset its construction and its eventual use, if the industry were to adopt all those technologies, then McKinsey argued that we could probably take 40% out of the cost of building stuff. Um, well, wow, 40% is a lot of money in the context of the, you know, approaching 100 trillion infrastructure gap that the world is talking about. Um, and as we know, infrastructure sort of underlies the success or failure, you know, between sort of 72 and 81% of the uh, sustainable development uh, goals, depending on whether you pick networked or non-networked infrastructure. 40% um, sound, sounds like an important saving, but turn it round. I mean, we already accept that today the world is probably investing too little in its infrastructure. If we were to continue to invest the same amount as we are today, rather than try and bank that 40% saving, we could build 66% more infrastructure for our money or in other words our generation now you know the the, the the taxes that we pay could buy 66 percent more schools hospital fresh water treatment you know all of the things that in particular the developing market needs in order to be able to um uh, jump in the development um and attain the targets that are set out within um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and, and all of that is around unlocking the use of technology within that sector. And, and so, you know, we come back to the theme of partnerships again. Um, it needs a partnership between the public and the private sectors. The public sector, um, in particular, needs to create the conditions in which that, um, that technology investment is rewarded. In other words, don't just award it to the cheapest price and 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 let and fool ourselves that we've got a good deal because we haven't got a good deal. What we've got is a cheap asset that will probably require more money to maintain it. It will fall apart earlier in its life, and what's more, we haven't we haven't invested in the ability to you know create that asset on a replicable basis using using some technology investment. Um, so the public sector through the regulatory frameworks it creates, through the way it procures assets in particular, has enormous power to set up an environment in which the private sector could really start to invest in that technology and in turn power the delivery of the sustainable development goals. So, so to, to me, that is, 
Um, that's the single most important thing we're facing. And, and I was, as you know, I, I sat on the World Economic Forum's uh, Future Infrastructure Council over the last couple of years. And, and one of the papers that we produced last year looked specifically at this issue of, of what can the public sector do to create an environment that encourages that um, innovation and technology investment. And, and if you, know, you were to ask me for the single biggest thing that I think will make the difference as to whether the world does achieve the SDG 17 in that time frame or not, it will be our ability to get our heads around creating that sort of partnership for technology innovation. Fascinating, Richard. I always enjoy so much our conversations about these topics we are all so passionate about. Anyway, we could go on for hours more, but unfortunately we don't have that time. So let me close with, first of all, thanking you for sharing your thoughts uh, with us. And I think that that really gives a lot of food for thought uh, to many uh, on these very critical topics. And then for those who are interested in going beyond just scratching the surface, which is what we have done during this half an hour that we spent together. There is a lot of materials that, uh, you know, is available on recent, uh, you know, thought leadership pieces or actually the synthesis of our practical experiences working in so many uh, countries and in so many different contexts that can be found uh, in uh, uh, KPMG, different and complex to navigate, I would say, uh, you know, website under infrastructure, under international development. But in particular, I would encourage everybody to go and take a look at KPMG Impact, which really provides a synthesis of, uh, you know, the many good things that uh, are currently happening and, uh, also the way in which we think some of these issues will evolve uh, in the years to come. Thank you so much for being with us today.